Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road. And those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. There's no other end. But they never learn. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Hiding Place. Mrs. Brown's gift shop. Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Waltman. The bookends? Well, let me see now. That was the little Dutch figurines, wasn't it? The boy and the girl? All right, fine. Well, I'll have to... Oh, hold... Hold the line a minute, Mr. Waltman. Mr. Marlowe, you... You're back. Yes, Mrs. Bryant. Did you find him, Mr. Marlowe? Did you find Chipper? Chipper is dead, Mrs. Bryant. Oh. oh Take it I easy, see. Mrs. Bryant. Maybe you better sit down no, here. I... No, no. I'm all right. There's a customer waiting on the phone. I'll finish that. Then I want you to tell me everything you found out about my son. Sure, sure. I'll only be a moment. As Martha Bryant went to the telephone, I braced myself for the story I had to tell her. I tried to figure some last-minute way of making hard facts a little softer for a sweet, brave, gray-haired lady. I deserved a better break. The first thought about what had happened brought the whole ugly business rushing back at me again. Turned my mind back like a clock to where it had all begun yesterday morning in my office. And that same Martha Bryant, full of hope and quiet courage, had walked up to my desk handed me a letter and asked me to find her son. His name is Chipper, Mr. Marlowe. Or rather, Chip, now that he's a grown man, he's uh. 22. He left suddenly without a word six months ago. Oh. I've heard nothing until this morning when that letter they addressed to Chip came in the mail. Postmark St. Louis Obispo. Oh, sit down, won't you, Mrs. Bryant? Thank yeah. you. Maybe I shouldn't have opened it, but... Well, you see, it's the first indication I've had in all that time that he's even alive. Read it. Uh -huh. Dear Chip, it's been a long drag, but the waiting is finally over, darling. Time is now. Meet me at 11.30 Monday night at the house with the big wheel, signed Toby. House with the big wheel, what does that mean, Mrs. Bryan? I have no idea. But for some reason, it frightens me. Oh. 11.30 Monday night. Monday night, that must be tonight. Who is this Toby? Toby Packler. She's a very, very beautiful young woman, platinum blonde. Oh. Chipper believed he was in love with her, I'm afraid. Oh, <laughs> please don't misunderstand me, Mr. Marlowe. I'm not a possessive mother. I knew I'd give Chipper up someday, only I hoped it would be to a nice, sincere girl. Toby Packler isn't? Well, she's much too fast. The kind who uses too much mascara and wears things like those little anklet chains they call slave bracelets. I tried to find her after Chip left, but she was gone, too. Oh. Tell me, did you and your son argue about Toby, Mrs. Bryant? No, no. I only saw her once. He knew I didn't think much of her, but that didn't drive him away, Mr. Marlowe. What did? Well, I've never been able to understand. After his father died, Chip became irresponsible and a little wild, perhaps especially since I had to spend all my time running our gift shop on Ivar, but but he was a good boy, really. I tried to convince myself that he left just to prove his independence, to uh, test his wings, you know. But now... Now what, Mrs. Bryant? Now I'm worried. That letter, it puzzles me. I don't like it. Well, well it may mean nothing more than you're getting a daughter-in-law who uses too much mascara. I hope you're right. I want Chip to be happy, to settle down. I, I want to turn my business over to him. And 
Will you try to locate it for me? Here, I have this picture here in my wallet. See? <laughs> Say, Chip looks a lot like his mother, doesn't he? Yes. <laughs> Please find out if my son is all right. Sure. I'll do my best. From my office window, I watched her leave the building. Saw her stop politely and answer a question for an oily sidewalk passerby in a black pinstripe suit. Then move quietly on down the street toward her shop on Ivar. A neat, gentle, very lonely woman. I hoped I'd find a happy story for her in San Luis Obispo. She had one coming. I was still hoping five hours later when I pulled into a mobile gas station in the little town at the foot of the Santa Lucia Mountains, 200 miles up the coast. I filled up, asked a few questions, and found out that there were only four good hotels, five not so good, and two or three dozen motor courts, and that ran the gamut. So even with nothing but the name Toby to go on, the job wasn't completely impossible. <laughs> By the time I'd worked my way down into the motor courts, the sun was sneaking off between the rocky hills toward the ocean, and I was still collecting negative answers, until I tried a mirrored neon combination bar, restaurant, and motel called Pinky's on the north edge of town. Sorry, mister, no Toby Packler registered here. Now, wait a minute, are you sure? She's a lovely platinum blonde about... About, about what? Huh? Oh, never mind. Skip it, Pinky. Maybe this is better. <laughs> When I glanced across the lobby at the bar, I'd caught a man watching me. He was the same oily character in a black pinstripe suit that I'd seen stop Mrs. Bryan on the street outside my office back in L.A. He ducked away, and I beat it into a bar. Just in time to see him slip out a side door. So I followed him. Outside a gravel path wormed through a grove of dejected pepper trees. Wound up in a lonely walled patio, and when I got there, oily was out of sight. The reason was simple. The nose of his gun in my back said he was behind me. Don't move, Marlowe. Well, well. Name and all. Yeah, sure. I've been tailing you every inch of the way since old lady Bryant went to see you this morning. What's the connection, Oily? Exactly six long months of watching and waiting. For what? For a move on you two skunks would have to make some time. And from the way you've been working, you don't know enough to do yourself any good or me any harm. So take some advice. Go back to L.A. Leave it alone. Leave what alone? That's none of your business, people. I'll take over from here. But just in case you run into Chip Bryant or Toby on your way out of town, tell them from me they're not cutting Lou Race out of his share of 110 grand. I'm going to get it, one way or another. And so as you won't forget, use this. Oh! For a reminder. When the brick floor of the patio finally stopped pushing, I was alone except for my ugly thoughts. I knew I was on the right track, but from the sound of things, Chip O'Brien was much less a mama's boy than his mama believed. I made sure Lou Race was nowhere around the motel. Then I went into the bar again to see what a double scotch would do for my headache. The bartender, obviously, was the type who got around, so I took a chance and asked him about Toby Packler. It was no good. But when I described Toby as a beautiful platinum blonde... A girl sitting alone, two stools down. A, a girl with a short, ragged, mouse-brown hair and extremely flat, misformed face. Dropped her eyes and looked away. I suddenly felt very cheap. I flipped a silver buck on the bar and got up. You know, it was the kind of dumb stunt you can't apologize for. You just leave. I was halfway to my car before I realized that the girl had followed me out. Hey, mister. Yeah, you. Just a minute. I turned and watched her come toward me. In the garish neon light, her face was jarringly unreal, the color and texture of hard putty. I, uh, I heard you inside when you asked about Toby. Yeah, I, I thought you had. Do you know her, Miss... Palmer. Oh. Yeah, I know her. She's one of my few friends. What do you want with Toby? Well, my Who name is you? Marlo. I, I'm from L.A. I want to talk to her about a fellow named Chip Bryant. She's my only lead. Chip Bryant? Yeah. She never mentioned that name to me. Anyway, you're too late, Mr. Marlowe. What do you mean? Toby left town this morning. Left she, town? Oh, no. She was going up north to Seattle, I think, on, on some kind of 
personal business. Alison, uh, did she ever say anything to you about a house with a big wheel, where it was, what it means? House with a big wheel? Yeah. No, I'm afraid not. I'm sorry, Mr. Marlowe. I guess I'm not much help. I... Well, good night. Thanks, anyway. Now, good night, Miss... Miss... Palmer. Yeah. Yeah, Palmer. Good night. As the girl walked back to the bar, the little gold chain I'd spotted around her ankle glinted in the brittle light. And it was like an echo of a memory. A slave bracelet on her was as out of place as a morning glory and a bed of toadstools. But that gave me a crazy hunch. A hunch that somehow in the last six months, a gorgeous blonde named Toby Packler had become a drab brown head with a flat, stiff face. So I didn't chase wild geese to Seattle. Instead, I got in my car and I waited. An hour went by and it was almost dark before she finally came out again. Stepped down into a sleek new convertible and drove north out of town. I followed as she turned off a neglected side road and for eight miles twisted through jagged rocky hills toward the mountains. Then suddenly from the crest of a small rise I saw what she'd been heading for. An old stone house squatting in a grove of eucalyptus trees. The girl I figured to be Toby Packler had slowed almost to a stop. I watched her creep along until she was out of sight. And I got out of my car and I went down for a closer look. Round, brown, shingled couplers reared proudly out of choking overgrowth and on a huge, rusty iron gate in the front was the name Escobar. But in the trees behind the house, I saw more. Turning slowly in the stream, there was a giant water wheel. A big wheel! <laughs> fast back to town and stopped at the only place I could figure for a quick answer. The office of the San Luis Obispo Daily Eagle. The night editor was strictly old school from green eye shade to sleeve gutters. But still very much on the ball. Sir, you want to see the issues of exactly six months ago, you say? Yeah. yeah that'd be November. About the 8th, 9th, and 10th. Uh, here you are, son. Help us out. Thanks. Thanks a lot. If I'm right, this ought to cinch it. Yeah, uh, 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 careful there. Don't uh. rip those copies. Say, by the way, uh, what story are you looking for? Oh, a small something on a party named Toby Packler. Uh, it's not here. Wait a minute, maybe it'll be in... Yeah, sure, sure, this is it on page three. A woman identified as Toby Packler of Los Angeles suffered severe injuries to head and face today when the car she was driving skidded into a bridge abutment two miles north of here. So that's how come the face. Miss Packler's condition was announced as critical by Clark Emergency Hospital attendant. Hey! Is that all you wanted? That's enough. If that answers your question, young man, I'll put these copies away. Got to be careful with Wait a minute, wait a minute, that headline. Eh? What was that? Let's see that. Santa Barbara jewelry store robbed. Daring thieves escape with gems valued at 110,000, 110 grand. Yeah, I remember that. Two men and a woman. Got away clean, too. Never caught a one of them. Uh, You don't mean there's a connection between these stories, do you? I don't know. Ask me again after I've checked in at the old Escobar place. Adam Escobar's place? Out in the hills? Oh, you're joking, son. What in the world could that crackpot possibly have to do with a jewel robber in a car wreck six months ago? It beats me, but there's some tie, and you can count on it. Uh, I think you're crazy. But if you're going out there, maybe you should be. Now, what's that supposed to mean? You'll have something in common with Adam. He's lived in his own private dream world for so long, he's uh, forgotten what the real world's all about. Uh, goodbye, son. I'll see you later. <clears throat> I hope. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first... The fun is always fresh and furious when Groucho Marx takes over on CBS Wednesday nights with his wonderful quiz, You Bet Your Life. Groucho, the master of ad lib, teams up pairs of opposites and then goes to work with his quips and questions. Very, very solid with laughter, this Groucho Marx show. Hear it this Wednesday and every Wednesday on most of these same CBS stations. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Hiding Place. The road I had thought of Adam Escobar's place is just another hundred-year-old country home. You know, the kind, big, aloof, wrinkled, like an aging nobleman who had retired long ago with his memories. 
now that I was there and at the rusted iron gate that resented my intrusion out loud, I changed my mind. I saw now it had to be a degenerate nobleman. Also, the nobleman had to be flat broke. I saw it everywhere. The name Escobar on the gate and copper lettering had turned a sickly spotted green. The scuffed, faded family crest inlaid in tile in the cement walk was cracked and crumbled. The exquisite stained glass door was cracked all the way down the middle. Only the engraved card in the slot under the knocker that said Adam Escobar Esquire was neat and new. The landed gentry's last-ditch stand. I was about to knock when... You need not bother knocking, sir. I saw you coming up the walk. I am Adam Escobar. He was a small, slight man of maybe 60-plus with a large head held high in spite of the frayed cuffs, patent leather slippers that were cracked and peeling. I introduced myself, then followed him into a musty living room. There, while he apologized for no longer having any servants and poured us each some brandy from a cut glass decanter, I told him all about my search for Chip Bryant, complete with Toby and Lou Race. Frankly, Mr. Marlowe, I am puzzled. Uh, uh, your drink, sir. Oh. Uh, confused. What does all this have to do with me? Well, maybe nothing, Mr. Escobar, but the only guess around is that the jewels were hidden here on your property, the house for the big water wheel the night of the robbery six months ago. But why? For what reason, sir? The police? Oh, probably. Trio wouldn't want to be picked up with the stuff on him. Salute. Under yours, sir. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> then, then, Mr. Marlowe, soon after they did that... Uh, Hit the jewels, I mean. The, the girl, the one with the injured face, uh, had that accident. Those are the circumstances. Oh, more or less. And if I've added right, company's coming by 11.30. It's 10.30 now. It might be a good idea if you left the home grounds for a while. Me? Leave my own home because of some thieves, because of three common Ah, uh, Mr. Escobar, it's that or the police, and I'd rather not have them in it for a while. I still owe my client the slight benefit of the doubt that's left. You think I am afraid? Is uh, that what you are trying to no, say? No, no, of course not. But I don't see why you should stick your neck out. These people have nothing to do with you. You are wrong, sir. Every honest man has something to do with every criminal. His duty. I know that now, Mr. Marlowe. If I had known it... Many years ago, I might still have both my wealth and my property intact. Well, okay. Who knows? When I come back, it come may be... Come back? But where are you going, sir? Into town. I'd still like to catch up to Chip Bryant before the reunion. I don't think there's going to be the time or place for conversation. Conversation? With that Bryant hoodlum? About what, sir? About a mother, Mr. Escobar. A nice old lady who doesn't deserve a kick in the teeth. <laughs> Back in San Luis Obispo, I returned to the missing person door-to-door canvas for the third time that night. Only now I can find myself to the wrong side of the tracks exclusively, and the deeper the dive, the better. I didn't figure that Chip Ryan would show anywhere else. And after a half a dozen quick stops, number seven proved lucky. It was a cramped, greasy bar with a sawdust and cigarette butt floor and a single customer. I hadn't found Chip, but I was close to the depth of Mr. Lou Race. The barkeep, a ball of fat, wearing a sweatshirt the size of a tent at his back to me when I entered. So did Race. So when I tapped the tricky man on his padded shoulder and he turned, he was surprised to see me swing. That slicker was an old debt. This? Just in case the cat got your tongue. Now get up. Get ready to answer a few simple questions. Hey, hey, hey. what do you think you're doing? You're busting my table. I'll pay you for it. Unless you want to be up to your rolling chins in trouble with the law, Junior, don't try to help the clientele. The cops? Oh, okay, okay. Why didn't you say so? I don't know nothing about this guy. And I don't know enough. Now, come on, race, you talk or eat sawdust. Which? Uh, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll tell you. Oh, what, what do you want? One, you, Chip Bryan, and Toby Packler stuck up that Santa Barbara jewelry store six months ago, right? Yeah, yeah, we, we did it. But they crossed me up. It was, it was when the cops were coming and we split. Splitter, you played hooray for Lou Race and ran without worrying about the others. Uh, what's the difference? The reason Toby and Chip Bryan won't tell you where they hid the jewels, that's a difference. Nuts. You're standing on one ear, peeper. Toby had a different reason for crossing me. Like what? Ah, oh, like her falling in love with that louse Bryant. The kid she baited into coming along with us. By flapping her baby blues, the kid who was supposed to drive the car, period. That's how she crossed me. Anything else? Yeah, the topper. Where's Brian now? One or two places. Either with Toby Packler or with us. Oh, Toby Packler. Good night, sweetheart. By the time I made it to the door, the second company, Sam Spade, was across the street behind a parked car and streaking for an alley in the middle of the block. Just as I thought I was going to lose him, he came abreast of a dark doorway and I saw it. 
An arm raised quickly, the glint of a knife blade, the arm dropped sharply. Whoever had done it slid away in the dark as suddenly as he appeared. When I was next to race, there was only the caller's card, a black ivory-handled knife. Driven to the hilt in between the dapper man's shoulders. He was going out fast. Hey, holy cow, how did it happen, Shut Mr. Shut up, Jones? race, race. Do you know who got you? Uh, the, the knife. Yeah? Has it, has it got a dark black eye? Black ivory handle, yeah. Why, why, what does it mean? Who's it uh, belong to, race? Uh, it's the kid. What kid? That's a lousy chip, Ryan. He's dead, huh? Yeah. And so are all the prayers of one Mrs. Martha Bryant. Huh? Who's she? Never mind, never mind. Listen, call the cops. Tell them my name's Philip Marlowe. I'm a private detective, and I may be able to explain all this later. Right now, I'm due at a house with a water wheel, and I'll explain that later, too. If I'm lucky. Mr. Marlowe, I'm glad you're here, sir. It is almost 11.30. I know. Have you seen anyone, Mr. Escobar? No, sir, and I have been watching very closely. Good. And in readiness, my father owned this pistol. Oh, well, I hope it's been oiled since. Now, look, I didn't locate Chip Bright. Hey, wait a minute, isn't that a car there turning off the road without any lights on? Yes, and going along the side of my property line, back to the water wheel. It is a woman, Mr. Marlowe. Yeah, no doubt named Tony Packler. Now, look, you stay here, Mr. Escobar, and keep that blunderbuss ready. Don't forget Chip Bryant's due out here, too, and he's a killer. Keep your eyes open. We'll stand a better chance meeting him one at a time. I went around to the side of the house quickly, then kept close into a long line of eucalyptus trees that ended at a crumbling building that had once been servants' quarters. After that, it was only 20 yards to the water wheel. 20 open yards to the huge, ancient circle of hand-hewn wood that complained against the side of a dreary squat stone mill that had long ago died of old age. There in the faint half-light of a hazy moon I saw Toby Packler, kneeling at the corner of the building and with both hands working furiously to loosen a stone the size and shape of a football. There was a gun on the ground next to her. I moved closer, my hand tight on the thirty-eight in my pocket. Then I waited till she had the stone out. And that baby ends a six-months-old secret. Were you... That wasn't bad aim, just a warning, Toby... How do you know my name? I read your mail. I get back over to your homespun safety deposit box there and take the jewels out. Go on. All right. Why shouldn't I, soldier? You won't go anyplace with them. Chip will see to that. He'll... They're gone. Get back. They're not here, I tell you. Do you understand? They're gone. Gone. All the hopes I Hold it. Every... <laughs> now tell me, is this where you hit him? Of course. Nobody else knew? Race or Chip Bryant? Race didn't even know about this place. But Chip... But... And don't dare move, Mr. Marlowe. Now, you drop your gun. Do it! Miss Packler, Mr. Adam Escobar, Esquire. Keep quiet! So Chip Bryant had the jewels all the time, did he? <laughs> I never thought of that. What do you know about jewels? Oh, quite a bit. You see, Miss Packler, that night six months ago when you stood over there on the other side of the water wheel and told Bryant that you had hidden the jewels and would tell him where later on, I was listening. You knew they were here. I'll tell anything to anybody. It was, of course, quite by chance that I overheard you. But after you had that accident with your car, I searched as diligently as though I were a partner. Searched Miss Peckler for money that could mean so, so much to me. But I found nothing. Then where are they? You idiot, tell me! Where are they, do you know? And now that I see this hiding place, yes. It was where Chip Bryan stood. Therefore, the jewels are no doubt buried. What do you mean? I think, Toby, that he killed Chip Ryan almost six months ago and that he buried him here on these grounds without knowing that Chip had already found the jewels. What? Chip? Dead? Quite dead. I killed him two days after your accident. I found him searching for the jewels. No. No, you're lying. Chip was supposed to go back to Los Angeles and wait until I was well. Wait for my letter. He didn't, Toby. He came out here, found the jewels, and was killed by our host. <laughs> no wonder I couldn't find them these months that I've searched day in and day out. Scratched them, dog, and cold, and it rained by sun and by dark. No wonder I buried them with him. Yeah, but you didn't bury his knife, did you? That you kept the news down Lou Race tonight. Exactly. Why, Stay you... Why, Miss Peckler? Why? So you can shoot me, then him? 
Or so that if I'm very lucky, I can run away to live some more. Toby, don't. Live with a smashed, ugly face. Thank what you. have I got to lose? You've been warned. My pretty face is don't gone. Don't take another step. The man I love is don't. gone. I soon said... the tools don't. Ah! Escobar. Turn around. Point that gun at me. Gletcher, Mr. Marlowe. Now it's self-defense. Toby. Toby is bad. Yeah. Real bad, soldier. I... I had so much once. Pretty face. A guy named Chip. Jules. I... <laughs> I had everything. <laughs> I was a, a big wheel. Wasn't I? So <laughs> Yes. Yes, Mr. Altman, the bookends will be sent out to you this afternoon at the latest. Thank you for calling. Goodbye. I'm sorry to have kept you, Mr. Marlowe. I... Well, it may be hard for you to believe. But in the minute I was on the phone, and even while I talked, I think I saw Chipper's whole life before me. I know what you mean. Well, Mrs. Bryant, I found out that your son, Chip. Yes. You found out what? Mr. Marlowe, what are you staring at? Oh, that showcase there. Oh. Our Mother's Day display. It's attractive, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, very. Mrs. Bryan... Chip was killed in a storm at sea a, a week, a week after you saw him. It, it was off San Francisco. His, his body was never recovered. I, I was told that he was on his way to a new job in uh, Canada at the time. And incidentally, that letter from San Luis Obispo, that, that was all a mistake. That girl never saw Chip again. I left my car where I'd parked it and walked through the busy city street. You know, it's a funny thing. Lies can cause more trouble in this world than almost anything else, they say. And at the same time, can sometimes bring the most happiness. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and written by Norman MacDonald and written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Joan Banks, Herb Butterfield, Louis Jean Height, Bob Griffin, Howard McNear, and Lee Millar. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It started at dawn in a Los Angeles taxi and wound up that night on a cliff in the middle of the Pacific. All because of a Dutchman with $50,000, a corpse in a lily pond, and an Oriental with a chauffeur who wanted a cloak made of nothing but feathers. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.